Good morning, Grace Bible Church. If you guys want to make your way back to your seats, if you guys want to stand with us, we don't have to. Let's start our service. One, two, your love is amazing. Steady and unchanging. Your love is You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. We are glad that you're here. We have just a few announcements for you before we get started with anything else. Uh, we have two morning Bible studies that are coming up. There's going to be a, uh, also a kids' Bible time. That begins on the uh, 10th of July, two weeks from today. And just so that we can plan in terms of space and that kind of thing, uh, please RSVP at the information table that is in the uh, main area. Not sure what's going on with this, but uh, VBS on 725 to 729. What's that? Help is on the way. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. should applaud for Dave. He did, does a good job. So. Yeah. I heard they had problems like this in the early church as well with the apostles and all that, so on. VBS, uh, the 25th of July to the 29th of July. The 30th of June is pre-registration deadline for that. Registration will open to the community on the 1st of July. Our limit is 100 kids. We hope we have to struggle with that limit. Uh, go to our website to register as well, by the way. And um, another announcement, speaking of audio-visual stuff like sound and uh, the video part of our church, uh, we could use some help with that. If you would like to help with that, learn how to run the sound, and you can rescue pastors like Dave does, and then also run some of our video stuff, we'd love to have your help. It would be a rotation basis. You wouldn't be stuck forever, and if you didn't like it, you could bail on it. But uh, we'd love to have you help. Let us know if you'd like to do that. We limit our Sunday morning announcements. And so there are newsletters that go out uh, by email, weekly, monthly email sent listings of all of our ministries. Uh, we have a sign up at the information table to be placed on our Google group. If you'd like to be a part of that, we'd love to have you. And you can find all that information on our website. And we roll those announcements on our screen prior to services as well. 
some big announcements today. Birthdays. Josh Keister, the 26th, has a birthday. Yay, Josh. Happy birthday. Heather Reed, on the 28th, has a birthday. Casey Wren will be 10 years old on the 29th. David Mike is breaking tradition. Uh, he told us that on the 30th he has a birthday, and unlike many adults, David wanted you to know he will be 75 years old. <laughs> Jackson Mao will be six years old on the 30th. Happy birthday to him. <laughs> on the 2nd of July, Michelle Ronecker has a birthday. Happy birthday to her. Now for some anniversaries. Uh, on the 29th, for nine years, Steve and Mandy Goodspeed have an anniversary. And then Paul and Melody Powell on the first five years have been married. And we also want to announce our famous announcement. Katie Powers and Derek Robbins will be married on the 31st, 331-23. They're engaged. Happy engagement to you. You guys can just keep doing that all you want. That's wonderful. So we, uh, most of you know we don't take up a formal offering. There are two black boxes that are by the entrances, and you can put your gifts in there if you would like. We sure appreciate your support. And those of you that have regular deductions from your accounts, those of you that use Venmo, we appreciate all of you for helping us to count on that on a regular basis. So really glad you're here. By the way, did you notice anything that happened this week? Um, for years and years and years, we've been praying for a decision that was made in my life in the 70s, well, in everybody's life in the 70s, and um, when the Supreme Court decision was made this week about life, one of the justices said this has never been a constitutional right and sent the decision for life back to the states, and we're so grateful for the decision, the pro-life decision this week. There was a man who once said, it is not the will of your heavenly father that one of these little ones should perish. So we're so grateful for that. Every week we like to uh, celebrate at the beginning of service, take the bread together, and at the end we take the cup together. And so uh, the men are going to come forward and we'll take the bread with one another. If you join us, uh, we will have a word of prayer. Hold on to the bread as you get it, please, and then we will uh, take it all together. If you are new to Grace Bible Church, we want to welcome you here today. And we want to tell you that the reason we bracket our services with these is that the death of Christ shows his great love for sinful people. And uh, most of us in this fellowship at one time or another thought, if somehow we could just be good enough, we'd be able to earn our way into uh, heaven. It doesn't work that way. And the reason Christ died was to pay for our sins because none of us ever have been or ever will be good enough. And his death meant that Jesus Christ offers everlasting life to everyone who believes in him for it. In fact, Paul talked about how evil he was. And when Paul talks about that, he says this, for me first, God set me forth as a pattern of those who would believe on him for eternal life. Paul says, I'm a pattern of those who would believe on him for eternal life. And if you believe in him for eternal life, you have it. And if you're a believer, let's just take a moment to make sure that we're right with God. And should there be sin, if you confess that sin, God is faithful always and righteous to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So let's take a moment of silent prayer before we pray. Father, as we come to the time where we're going to take the bread, we're reminded that you are the God of life. In an unusual commandment in the Old Testament, 
you would not allow the Israelites to eat the blood of the sacrifice. And through that, you taught them that the life of the flesh is in the blood, that you are the God of life. And so we thank you, Father, for all the unrest and anger in America. Thank you once again that life has been affirmed. And whatever the outcome, we know that you give life to all who believe, and we know that all life is precious to you. Thank you for proving that at the cross. In Christ's name, amen. Go ahead and take together. And this is yours. Friendship's an interesting concept. Ever since the um, issues with COVID, one of the things that we've experienced in the country is a, um, a lot of depression and anxiety. People feel lonely and isolated. As you know, most of you are well aware that suicides have skyrocketed, uh, that mental issues around the nation are, are very significant. And as we come to 1 Samuel chapter 20, we come to a, a chapter that for today, I'm just going to summarize it for you, and then we're going to look at this amazing friendship that David and Jonathan had. In fact, if you were to look at uh, a study of friendships in the Bible, they'd probably stand out, if not the greatest, one of the greatest examples of that. Friendship, as defined in a general way, is a person whom one knows and with whom one has a bond of mutual affection, typically exclusive of sexual or family relations. In Baker's Bible Dictionary, it talks about a biblical definition. And in the Old Testament, it is a participle form, meaning one who loves. In the New Testament, there's a lot of words for it. A lot of you know that Philadelphia is a city of brotherly love. And in the New Testament, philos is the word that means something like friend or fond affection. Uh, there are words that mean companion, comrade, uh, people outside one's family for whom one feels special affection. There are a few different meanings of it, the last of which is a technical term for a fellow believer. But in both Testaments, the idea of friend and friendship involve three components. One, association. Two, loyalty. Three, affection. There are also three levels of meaning. Friendship as association only. You know, do you know him? Yeah, he's a friend. I know who he is. And then there's friendship as association plus loyalty, that higher level of commitment. And then the third, and this is used a lot when it talks about disciples of Jesus, not just people who have believed in him for life, but people who are following him and growing in him. Friendship as association plus loyalty plus affection. Remember, Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you to do. Uh, more than just knowing him, but it's walking with him. The lowest level of friendship is simply an associate, that, that other fella, that other guy. It's used in the book of James, for example. Remember when Jesus said, friend, why did you come here when he was being taken? At a higher and theologically more interesting level is the idea of friendship that contains not only the component of association, but that of loyalty. The king's friends is in 2 Samuel 15, kind of is what we used to call his kitchen cabinet with Harry S. Truman. They talked about that. Um, it was someone who serves as a royal advisor. In the Maccabean period, between the Testaments, between the Old and the New Testament, in that period, it was someone who is a member of a favored class of nobles. There's a higher, higher level of friendship in the Bible, it contains those components of association plus loyalty plus affection. That was David and Jonathan. And in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about, it's a word called metakoi. It means like a partner. Jesus will take believers and he invites them to be faithful, to be metakoi. There's partner in the kingdom. And when we talked about that kitchen cabinet with the president, those close advisors, the king had those too. And the Bible talks about the king and his companion, the king and his metakoi. Those are faithful believers. And so today, in fact, uh, this article talks about 
these covenants that they made t- together. And I want to just summarize. This is my summary. It's not the Bible, but very close. Um, it says, after the events of chapter 19 in which Saul repeatedly tried to kill David, he knows his life is in danger, and he wants Jonathan to know. Jonathan's appalled. He said, now, Dad's not going to do anything to hurt you. And so as they talked, as they talked, while Jonathan initially doesn't believe it, he's willing to find out, tell me what you want me to do, David. How should we handle this? Together they make a plan to find out Saul's heart toward David and then let David know the outcome, let David know what's going on. So they get this plan. David's intentionally going to miss some of the meals. And at the first meal, uh, Saul says nothing. But later on, when Saul asks where David is, Jonathan's going to tell him that he gave David permission to go sacrifice with his family. David's older brother, he said, wanted him to know that. And so he says, I told him he could go sacrifice. At this point, Saul explodes. Man, he just loses it. In fact, he uh, (laughs) says to his son, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't you know that as long as he lives, you're never going to be king? And he... (laughs) He's worried because his son may not be king. Well, he's a good dad, right? And so because he's so worried that his father might be king, he throws a spear at his son and just misses him. Uh, It's kind of weird. Jonathan obviously is upset. And this happens. Just so you know, dads, if you ever do throw a spear or try to kill your kids, it upsets them. (laughs) Together, he comes to David and he tells him about this and it uh, lets David know the outcome through the plan they had devised, and they weep together over the reality of Saul's hatred. And they made a covenant between them before, that re- reflected before, it reaffirmed their friendship with one another. Let them know, I'll be faithful to your family, and I want you to be faithful to mine. Should I use the handheld, Dave? Let's try that today. I don't think this is going to work real well. Pardon us. You too can bring microphones to the pastor if you'd like to help with the AV team. So this sets a tone for the rest of the book. The relationship between Saul and Jonathan now is strained. Dad and son have got issues. And Jonathan, in loyalty to David, because he knew it was loyalty to God, is loyal to his friend David. And it gives us a good study on friendship. This is dropping back to chapter 18. Jonathan realized David's a spiritual man. And when he recognizes that, look what it says. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, that is, David, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. In Hebrew, the word probably here is it loved him as his own life because of David's relationship with the Lord. So at the end, it says, Jonathan took off a robe that was on him. He gave it to David with his armor, even his sword and his bow and his belt. And you know what? I'm going to actually grab one of these myself, if I may. Let's take a time to look at some of the principles that we gave you. (laughs) We're going to go home today. How'd this morning go? Oh, it was fine. So a couple things. Sometimes the Lord brings you into your life. It brings people into your life. You just click. Have you ever met anybody? And as you're talking to them within minutes, you guys just click. There's this bond that's established. You feel like I could be friends with that person. In fact, at times I've heard the kids will come home. And I'll hear the kids say, we could be friends. I could tell we could be friends. We've got a lot of common interests. That was true with David and Jonathan. But in their relationship, what was that bond? Where did that start? David had just killed Goliath. It was a spiritual relationship. Do you know that my closest friends, as I've thought about it over the years, some of my closest friends, I'm fairly convinced we would not be friends if we were not believers. But because we are They're some of my closest friends. That's always been the basis of our friendship. Do you have friends like that? If you don't, you should have because you'll develop a closer relationship with them than anyone else. Second, notice that genuine friendship friendship reflects genuine spiritual love. That's why Jonathan reacted to David that way. Again, do you have that relationship? The main idea today is a good friend values their friends and what happens to them. So if you're valuing your friends... Your friends because you drink together? Your friends because you work on cars together? What is the basis of your friendship? If that spiritual element isn't there, I would deepen it. And we're going to mention this later in the message, but men and women, that's especially true in, in marriage, dating, things like that. And if your relationship is on a different level, I promise you it's not going to be as deep, but you can still change that. 
you can still change that. So there may be a number of reasons you married whom you married, and you might say, you know, we really don't have a great spiritual relationship. Develop it. It'll make a difference. It's going to make a difference. And then finally, genuine friendship is not self-centered but unselfish. Our interests should be their best interests. Philippians 2 talks about the way Jesus loved us. After Paul's example of how he loved the Philippians, remember it says this, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another. It doesn't mean feel that way toward one another. It's the way you look at another person. You regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you. I like the New American Standard. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, held on to, but he emptied himself, and then it goes on and says he died for us and was exalted for it. But here's my, here's my question. Are your friendships on that level? Now think about this. Think about it practically. Think about people at work that you just can't stand. What about praying for them? What about developing a relationship with them on that level? And, and you say, well, this is a person that doesn't want to talk about the Lord. Then by all means, don't at this point. What about just showing interest in them? Hey, John, I heard you had surgery last Thursday. How are you feeling with that? You know, how can I? Um, a lot of times when we'll go in, I'll go into restaurants with people, I'll oftentimes say to the waitress or waiter, uh, please feel free to say no to this, but uh, is there anything that we can pray for you today? And before they can answer, I say job, health, money, family, relationships, something like that. And invariably, they'll say, you can pray for my grandmother. She has surgery next Thursday. Or, yeah, I'm looking for one of the ladies that I talk to when I go to a certain restaurant. She'll say, would you pray for her? I can find a good car, things like that. And it opens up conversation this last week. By the way, 100% true story, Nathan and I went out to lunch this last week. And when we were there, this young lady that I'd asked several times, can I pray for you? Apparently, she knows I'm a religious guy. And she said, can I ask you a question about today, about everything that's been going on? And obviously, we all knew what we were talking about. I said, sure. And she said, I was told that because of this law now, if a baby dies when the woman's pregnant, she has to carry that child to term with the baby in there. Yeah, that's exactly what we said to her, too. <laughs> that's just not true. And so we went into a conversation. We talked about the unborn and about truths about them. I said, are you aware that baby has separate DNA you know this baby has separate blood type, and I don't know, Nathan, how long we talked her, five, ten minutes, but, you know, she, I didn't know that, you know, and we, yeah, I, I think I agree with you, and she said, well, that's what my friend told me. Anyway, so we're kind of developing that. There's a, there's a lady that waited on uh, our family, myself, when I would go uh, back in the day to Ruby Tuesdays, and then she ended up at this same restaurant that I frequent so often, and it, it had been, for 15 years, I knew this lady, and it never felt like a good chance to to witness to her. You know that feeling when you feel like if we talk, it's going to be forced? This is a, and it's good to avoid that. But one day in this restaurant we've been going to lately, I had a chance, I, the door just opened up, and I tried sharing the Lord. I said, would you, I'd love to tell you someday how, because now we're, we're, we know one another. Love to tell you someday how you could know you have eternal life. She said, I would really like that. But it was about the time all the people were coming in the door of the restaurant. It just didn't work out. So I said, well, I do have these little booklets I'd be happy to give you. I wanted to talk with her. It just didn't work out. Gave her one of those and came back uh, sometime later. It, it took a while because I wasn't there all the time. Of course, we didn't always see one another. And one day when I came back in, I said, hey, did you have a chance to read that booklet I gave you? And she said, I sure did. And I, and I talked to her about her relationship with Christ. If you believe in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life, what do you have? And she smiled at me and she said, I have eternal life. And we talked about how she had believed in Christ. My point is this. Pray and work to develop that spiritual side of your friendship with people. It'll make it deeper and the Lord will make it pay off in your marriage with your parents and I know this is hard for you to hear, some of you, but I would encourage you this way with your mom and dad, especially if your folks are somewhat irritating to you at times. Mom and dad, how can I be praying for you? How can I be praying for you? I'll tell you something, it's hard to dislike someone you're praying for. 
And for your kids, the same thing. If you don't have that relationship with people, develop that part of your friendship like David and Jonathan did. Well, let's go on here. Now, we're going to go to 1 Samuel 19, 2 to 4a right now. So Jonathan told David, this is now last week again, my father Saul seeks to kill you. This is not a good conversation starter, by the way. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. I'll go out and stand beside my father. And he's telling him this, this story of how he's going to let him know how he's going to deliver David. And he says, because your work's been very good toward me, he, he says to, to his dad, hey, dad, David took his life in his hand for you. Dad, David's a good guy. David's a spiritual man. And he says to his dad, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for Israel. Dad, you saw it. Dad, you rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood and kill David without a cause? So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he will not be killed. And I just want to make one point in your notes on this. Genuine friendship is loyal. It's one of the things I love the most about my wife. My wife is a loyal person. And we'll tell people at times, you know, I'd rather you not talk that way about them around me. That's my, she's my friend. He's my friend. That's loyalty. And it's easy to kind of give into the crowd, isn't it? But genuine friendship biblically is loyal. Let's go on and talk about another passage. This is later. And David is now running from Saul. Look at Jonathan, the way he treats David. So then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel. I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. They made another covenant again. So what's he do? He goes and he encourages him. And what I, the only point I want to make there is genuine friendship seeks to encourage. It emphasizes truth and honesty with kindness. Genuine friendship is grounded on commitment to our friends. That's why it's loyal. And then finally under this, genuine friendship wants what God wants in the lives of each. It's spiritual and accountable to God. I remember I wanted to minister with a friend of mine at seminary, and I said, hey, man, let's, let's go out in the ministry together. Let's minister together. And he goes, we've got the kingdom to hang out with one another. Let's split up and let's serve the Lord in different places and maximize our efforts, words to that effect. He wanted what was best for the Lord's glory, and that was his definition of our friendship. Jonathan dies later, and in 2 Samuel 1, here's what it says. David is talking about his friend. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I'm distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of a woman. You know, this has been a, a really butchered passage because there's no indication in any way of anything negative in their relationship or contrary to God's laws. But I want to make these comments about this. While few co things are compared to the love we have in marriage, even marriage can be encumbered with expectations and needs, at times making success of your friendship in marriage more difficult. Friendship doesn't have those issues. And this has been downplayed a lot, and it's also been twisted in our society today. But I know how much Cheryl at times loves going out and hanging out with other women and that relationship they can have. And I know that my whole life I've loved hanging out with guys. There are very few things I enjoy doing more than playing basketball, volleyball, you know, whatever. A lot of you guys like to hunt, to fish, whatever it might be. And we've never really talked about those friendships and how great they can be. There's a special element to them. And so it's in that sense that a friend's love can be said to be better than one spouse. All he means is that there are certain issues we don't have to deal with. And when you interject another element into it, you're actually missing the point completely. How about this? Let's look at a few Proverbs. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. And the comment I make in your notes is, a wise person pursues friends. And it says to hang out with the right kind of people. The Bible indicates choice. And one of the verses I, I gave you and will give you is the, when it says the righteous should choose his friends carefully for the way of the wicked leads them astray. When your parents give you a red flag or a yellow flag about somebody, their concern is how it's going to impact you. And you're either a missionary or you're a mission field. I know because I was a mission field to a lot of my friends. Today I try to be more of a missionary. So... 
That's what you need to ask yourself. Am I helping them or am I hurting them? And for some of you, let me just say this, because some of you are uh, drinking, and not just drinking, but drinking to excess with your friends, maybe doing drugs. Maybe there are sexual relationships that you have. And I want to just say this to you. The impact you have on your friends could impact them for eternity. If they're believers, you're hurting their future eternally. If they're unbelievers, you are really hurting their future eternally. You say you love them. Do you love them enough to do what's best for them, or is it a selfish relationship? Are you living for their approval, or are you living for their benefit? Proverbs 12. The righteous, I mentioned, should choose his friends carefully. Why? Because people are going to impact you. And every parent in this room knows that a lifetime of work in your life by us can be undone by a friend in a short amount of time and can ruin all that hard work. So I, I write this, genuine friendship should involve deliberation and choice. Now watch, this should extend to dating and marriage. We think about friends, we sometimes just think about those of the same gender, but this goes to dating and marriage as well. And so as you're considering who you might spend your life with, Bible says you should do it carefully. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord, but you should make a choice. When we fail to do it, we pay a high price. In 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about, it says, bad company ruins good habits. Bad company ruins good habits. And so that's what we were saying earlier, is your friends can destroy everything your mom and dad have been trying to do in a good way in your life. And you think they're trying to interfere. They kind of like you. Well, they at least love you. So another, this is kind of a quick hopscotch through chapter one. But it says this, listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. There'll be a garland around your neck, your head, and chain to adorn your neck. My son, of sinful men entice you, don't give in to them. And in your notes it says, in general, parents really do have your best interests in mind, and Proverbs encourages you to listen to them. They say, well, my parents really don't like you. Trust me, they gave birth to you. Trust me, they've, I remember I said to my dad, you know, you haven't said you love me very much. And my father was appalled and looked at me and said, I have, your whole life I fed you, I clothed you, I gave you a place to live. How can you say that? And people are more attractive to others when they are wise. That's why it says, you know, it's going to, it, wisdom makes, is, makes you a more attractive person. And it's true. Proverbs goes on and said, my son of sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come along with us, let us lie in wait for innocent blood. Interesting. Let's ambush some harmless soul. I memorize this in the New King James. I have to keep. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We'll get all sorts of valuable things. We'll fill our houses with plunder. Cast in your lot with us. Let us all have one purse. We'll all share the loot, it says here. Look at your notes. It says, when you know someone is foolish, you should follow your head, not your heart. Do you know that the number one reason that people join gangs is for that friendship, that intimacy? Because they're lonely, and they want that. So you've got to follow your head. The bad guys, the BGs, which wasn't a bad group, what God wants you to do in this section, he wants you to be staying alive, staying alive. Uh, 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 uh. So... He points out that the bad guys are brilliant at making what is dangerous sound fun. And they do. They do. <sighs> Dumb story of the week. I've never had a problem in my life. I've had a problem with a lot of sins. Not taking things. Except one day. I told the story years ago. Maybe you remember. We were in a store and we were looking through. They used to have these things called records. And we were looking through these albums, I'll explain sometime, and as we're looking through them, there was a dog chain laying there. And my friend said, hey, grab that. Our dog didn't use a chain. We didn't need a dog chain. And so naturally, I put it in my pocket. If you're ever going to take a dog chain, make sure that the leather strap doesn't hang out your pocket. So as I was Walking out of the store, the store detective said, young man, so I went up there, and as I was ruining my deodorant, he was talking to me about this, and he said, why did you, did you need the dog chain? I said, no. Why did you take it? I don't know. He told me to take it. Now, 
Thankfully, the man did not say, if he told you to jump off of a bridge, would you do that too? Old joke for those of you that don't know. And the guy, I think he could tell because I was shaking so much, he let me go. Don't take dog chains. This, the only, why did I do it? I started smoking because my friend smoked. I started doing drugs because my friend did. I took dog chains because my friends told me to. Because I was an idiot. And I wanted their approval. And that can happen. So they say, hey, cast in your law with, come on, buddy. They appeal to a sense of power. That's what it does here. Hey, we're going to, gangs do that. They want to convince you that you can safely get something for nothing. That's the reason you want to meet. Hey, let's grab it. It's free. The bad guys use a sense of friendship and community to draw you in. And if you think about it, they do. That's why, you know that, that the, one of the number one selling items in the world is when freshmen get to college, they like to buy sweatshirts and notebooks and everything with that college emblem on it because they want that sense of community, that sense of pride. goes on. My son, do not walk, go along with them. Don't set your foot in their paths, for their feet rush to evil. They are swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net where every bird can see it. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. See what he's saying? You know, in your notes, I make a couple notes, stay away from them. You can't even call them bird braids. A bird is too smart to be taken that way, but these guys will do it. And I know because I've run with some people like that, I wish it was a figure of speech alone. It's not. Let's talk about what Proverbs says later. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. And there are prisons filled with people who have done this because they don't want to say no. Because other people's approval is more important than yours. And the reality is, those of you that are younger know that I'm telling, well, those of you that are older too know I'm telling you the truth. The reality is, is that oftentimes we want people's approval more than God's. The leaders were like that in John 12. Many of the rulers believed in him, but they were not openly confessing him, for they loved the approval of men more than the approval of God. Who are you living for? Proverbs 14.7 says, Stay away from a fool, for you will not find knowledge on their lips. The New King James says, To stay away, get, leave the presence of a fool when you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. So that's going to rub off onto you, and the observation I make in your notes is, don't make foolish people your close friends. Their influence can be disastrous. You don't think so? Look at this one. Don't make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. I want to tell you a story about this. My, my parents were outstanding parents. Loved them very, very much. But this principle I saw in their life. My uncles, mom and dad, I learned a lot about my grandfathers. I never remember ever seeing any of my grandparents. Both my grandfathers used to beat up the men in the family. And both my parents came from angry homes. My mom and dad, the reason I say they were good parents is that my mom and dad were much, much, much better parents than their parents. But change is incremental, right? Some of you have imperfect parents too. You know what I'm talking about. And maybe as you've learned about your mom and dad, you've learned, boy, they really did a much better job than their parents. But still, progress is slow. And in our home, there wasn't always a lot of discussion. Sometimes, sometimes it would get emotional in our family. And those kinds of habits are easy to learn and they're hard to shake. And I've spent my life doing it in some ways. And so... Sometimes our friends are our greatest influence. And then I wrote this in your notes, for better or for worse. You're either a missionary or a mission field, men and women. This, this one to end, this section. A discerning son heeds instruction, but a companion of gluttons disgraces his father. And the idea of gluttons is people that are given to excess, not just in eating, but in many areas. And so I write this. When we spend time with people given to excess, eating, drinking, immorality, and self-gratification, instead of self-control, it leads to embarrassing consequences. It leads to embarrassing consequences. And men and women, that's true. And you're building your life now and you're building your future. Think about your friendships. 
When the Bible talks about friendship, when it talks about love, if you remember, it's patient, it's kind, and so on and so on and so on. Those are the qualities that should characterize your friendship. And my question to each of us is this. Is that the kind of friend you are? Because it's possible that you're sitting there thinking, I really don't have that many friends, and my friends don't love me that way. Well, you know what? He who has friends must show himself friendly. And the Bible says a friend loves at all time. It doesn't say a friend always waits and watches to see if other people love them the right way. You're going to find joy not as you focus on how much your friends love you. You're going to find joy when you focus on how much you are a good friend to others. And it doesn't take much, especially in today's world. I have a question for you. Think about those that really matter to you. How many times in the last several days have you sent a text? How you doing? Just want you to know I appreciate you. Phone call. Are you developing good friendships or are you waiting for someone else to love you? Because if you wait for someone else to love you, if you become or are a self-centered person, as I can be so many times, it's going to be a long wait. It's going to be a long wait. The best way to have friends is to be a good friend. And you'll find that as you seek to love other people that you'll have a lot more joy in your life than as you wait for others to love you. And sometimes, if you're like me again, you're spending so much time thinking about what uh, uh, being self-centered and how people don't love you that you're not loving other people. And you're also missing things. You know, one thing about the Apostle Paul that was true, he rejoiced always, he prayed without ceasing, and everything he gave thanks. And Paul could be in jail, and he was jailed unjustly. The only reason he was jailed was for preaching Christ. And while he's in jail, he had eyes to see. And he said, Lord, this is so great. I'm able to share Christ with the guards that have me chained up. And now the gospel's getting into the palace in Rome. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord, for that. And then Paul could say, you know, later on, you know, I know you're concerned that I may die. It's so much better to die than to live here. Because after this last week, I thought about all the things that are happening to some of the clinics and to some of the churches at times, I've gotten scared when I've thought about it. But you know, Paul said, not that this is something we should want on one level. But I remember talking about our firstborn son when he was with the Peace Corps. And I talked to my mentor, and I said, I was having trouble sleeping last night. Why were you having trouble sleeping? I thought something could happen to him. He might die. And of course, I prayed about it. And when I prayed about it, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, did not guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus because I kept focusing on he could die, he could die. I didn't have the eyes of Jesus. And my mentor said to me, Dan, isn't that very much better? Oh, don't say that to me. I wanted him, he said the wrong thing. I wanted him to say, oh, it's going to be fine. Here's a promise of God that says nothing's going to happen to him. And he said, no, it's so much better. Pray about it, trust the Lord, but it's so much better. Isn't that a great perspective? And when Paul talks about others preaching a false gospel, he says, and in the original language, this is the way it goes, he says, in this I will rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. It's Paul kind of psyching himself up biblically, biblical psych up. I will take this perspective. I will look at it this way. And he said this, having that perspective, will turn out for my deliverance. You know what Paul's deliverance was? I don't want to be ashamed before Christ. Because you know what, men and women? We're not going to be here that much longer. This world isn't going to be as it is that much longer. Don't you see it? Can't you tell? More than anything in life, our heart's desire should be for our friend who said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And to realize that no matter what, we will be with him. Don't fear him who can harm the body. The one you should worry about is the one that can cast body and soul into hell. That's our friend. And until then, to live our lives with joy, we've got to have perspective. So, a few, a few practical things. First, be intentional. Initiate. Quit sitting there staring at your phone and ask why it doesn't ring. Because everybody on Saturday night is sitting home thinking, I bet everybody else is having fun tonight. <laughs> and nobody's calling the other people. Make them a priority. Love is spelled T-I-M-E. Pursue the relationship with phone calls, with texts, with emails, arrange meeting times. Love them, love them, love them. A friend loves at all time. 
A friend seeks the other person's best. But be wise. <laughs> Sometimes I'll say to people, you know, my, I, I always am concerned. Am I calling too much? Am I bothering you too much? You can, you can you know, stop loving me. <laughs> Second, be spiritual. Don't focus on yourself but them. There was a show called Blind Date years ago. Anybody ever see that Blind Date? Raise your hands if you did. Nobody. Great. Well, they would, they would go on these blind dates, and we, Cheryl and I occasionally would watch them. Love wasn't spelled T-I-M-E. It was spelled D-U-M-B because as they're out on these dates, all these people did was talk about themselves. You want to have a great date with someone? Talk about them. So what, what, do you, what are your plans in the future? What would you like to do? You wake up at 6 in the morning in 10 years. You're going to your job. What would you like it to be? Really, how long have you wanted to do that? What, you, what do your parents do? Really, how long have they been doing that? Ask questions. Care about them. Have them mean something. Stop being all about you. It was such a terrible show. And they'd say, I didn't have a good time. Do you know what? You talk about other people, and there's a pretty good chance they're going to go home and say, do you have a good time? I had a great time. They don't say, I talked about me the whole time. But they do. Build your relationship around common interests and make sure Christ is one of them. Pray for them. Forgive them. Forgive them. Pursue their growth in Christ and avoid what doesn't fit that paradigm. Accept them to an extent. We, we want what's best for those we love. Always accept their failures and never accept their failures. Love them enough to look past them, but love them enough to care about those failures and to help them. Can we ignore biblical standards and truly love someone? I really love you. Let's have sex outside of marriage. Wow. Number three, be encouraging. Life's difficult, and one of the main commands toward the church is to daily encourage one another. Do you know that biblically, Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 10, as the day approaches, you know what he says to do? I'll bet somebody here knows. What are we supposed to do more and more as things get tougher? Tell me. What is it? Encouraging one another and all the more. Say, this has been, a, in, in one way is a wonderful week, in other ways a tough week. You know what you do? You encourage them. You don't stare at your phone and say, why is somebody not encouraging me? You encourage each other. He's, and the Bible says in Hebrews 3 to do it daily. To do it daily. Because the Hebrews fell in the wilderness. Why? Ten guys come back and they said, they are really, really big. And we're going to lose. And two guys said, we can do it. We can do it. And so his solution is, Take, beware, brethren, Christian, lest there should be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in falling away from the living God, but encourage one another daily while it is called today, while you have a chance. Yeah, I knew that he was having a hard time. I should have called him. Yeah, you should have. What's that look like? Next, be selective. The reality is that you only have so much time for your highest priority relationships. A man of many friends comes to ruin. You spread yourself too thin, it's hard. Make priority relationships. And so a lot of times I'll be at home and I've gotten back to back to back to back to back to back 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 calls. And at times I just have to put the phone down and say to Cheryl, let's watch a show together. It happened last night. Choose your priority relationships and use your time wisely. Finally, be generous, be a kind person with your time, your resources to Christians and to non Christians. But know the difference in relationships. You've either a missionary or a mission field. What drains you? What drains them? What builds you up? What drains them as well? A good friend values their friends and what happens to them. I had something really cool happen in my life. When I was younger, my mom was my closest friend. And almost everybody here knows and has heard me mention several times that she was killed in a car accident when I was 15. So when she died, I not only lost my mother, I lost my closest friend. And dad and I just really, <laughs> we were just very different personalities and did not get along. But you know, I want to tell you a great story. As I got older and learned more about all that my dad went through, I realized dad wasn't as much the problem as I was. I remember I was in my 40s, five, six years ago, and we were sitting at the table talking, and as dad and I were visiting, um, dad told me that if he ever said anything grandpa didn't like, he would knock him flat. Not a figure of speech. 
And I turned to dad. I said, you never did that. And he said, well, I, I figured, what's the use? My father was a better father than his dad. I don't know what grandpa went through. I'm not trying to make him look bad publicly. But I realized dad really tried to be a good father to me. And so the good story at the end of this story is that before my dad died, he was a good friend. Now, I don't know who in your life you're distant from. I don't know who you struggle with. But my question to you today is, are you a good friend to people? Or are you a self-oriented person always thinking of you? And I will say this about your life and mine. At the end of our lives, if the Lord Jesus is kind as he is and gracious as he is and teaches us, what a great thing that you'd be able to stand before God and the Lord would say to you, you were a great friend to people, like David was and like Jonathan was. Team's going to come up and lead us in song. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we close today? Father, thank you for the example of David and Jonathan who showed us what good friendship looks like. And Father, I, especially when I'm hurting, I can be such a terrible friend to other people. I get angry at uh, not being loved the way I'd like to be loved, and then I don't love. And I thank you for the teaching of your word. I pray that you will help me and all my friends here today to be good friend to others. And I pray that we might look like Jesus, who is a wonderful friend to us. What a friend we have in him. I thank you for him, Father. Help us to be like him, not just individually, but as a church. In Christ's name, amen. guys would like to stand with us. Let's worship.
You may be seated. The man who wrote that song wrote it when the captain of the ship came to him and told him, this is the approximate location that all of your family was killed. And they went down in a shipwreck. And he wrote that. Life is about perspective. You can't avoid problems. You can't avoid suffering in life. What you can do is go through it with Jesus. Let's pray as the men pass out the cup. Fathers, we come to this time and we take the cup together. I pray that we'll realize that the way our soul is made well is not by our own self-determination, but by you. Help us to have perspective. Help us to love as you have loved us. Thank you for the one who loved us and was such a good friend to us that he shed his blood for us. In Christ's name.
think everyone has the cup now. No greater symbol of what friendship is all about. Let's thank the Lord for it together. Those of you that have the cups in the congregation, if you pass them to your left. us. We have one more song before we close. Hopefully it's fast. One, two, three, four. all very much. Just a couple quick things before we go. First, you should know and give accolades to my nephew who won the horseshoe competition yesterday, right? At the family reunion. Good. Good job, Nathan. We're proud of you. Um, <laughs> tonight, we have the men's meeting. I hope that you'll come. It's going to be a great time of fellowship and time in the Word. We hope you'll all come and invite your friends to come to that as well. And I have a new friend, a new Mike up here. The other one gave me a lot of static, but we're grateful for him, so... Let's pray before you get, start throwing things and we'll be dismissed. Father, 
You are a great God, and you have done great things for us. Help us to use you as an example of what we should be as friends to others. May you be honored by that. Dismiss us with your blessing. We love you, Father. In Christ's name, amen. Have a great week, y'all.